the narcissist's illegitimate humanity. Part 1. The False Parent The malignant narcissist may be a human being, but he is anything but human. Genuine human beings possess a certain quality that is foreign to the narcissist, and that is humanity. Humanity is essential to one's claim of humanness. It is the essential characteristic of being human. Humanity springs from the inner self of a man or a woman, and it is characterized by things like compassion, sympathy, and consideration. It's the one trait that distinguishes mankind from the animals. And it is the key to being human. It is the prerequisite to being human. Humanity is prerequisite to becoming a legitimate human being. Narcissists are fully aware of the inhumanity resident in themselves. They don't, however, consider this aspect of their being a liability. They're proud of it. Narcissists have chosen and happily embrace the conscienceless life. They are perfectly content with their inhumanity. They have completely, absolutely, and irrefutably identified themselves with their inner darkness. It's who they are. It's what they are. Narcissists believe with every fiber of their being that they are superior to God. Superior to God's law and superior to any who aspire to follow their own conscience. They believe your conscience is your weakness. They believe your humanity is their calling card for exploitation. They despise, detest, and they ridicule your empathy. They don't hide their true self from you because they're ashamed of it. They hide their true self from you because they can accurately predict your reaction to the appallingly inhumane being that actually exists inside. They hide their true self from you because they want something from you. Be it supply, worship, labor, or money. The narcissist does not view him or herself as subhuman. 
they view themselves as superhuman. And I honestly think many narcissists believe their inhumanity makes them a god. A god entitled to fear and worship from those of us who have humanity in our hearts. We're talking about a certain mindset. We're talking about a certain level of consciousness in the narcissist. This awareness is common with each and every malignant narcissist on some level. An awareness of the utter emptiness of their own inner landscape. They are free of the pangs of conscience, and they know it. They have compassion for no one but themselves, and they know it. They feel no humaneness, not even for those closest to them, and they know it. This knowledge leads to a thought process shared almost universally among the narcissists. And this thought process goes something like this. With the exception of those under my direct influence, such as family, spouse, sometimes employees, I cannot for one moment allow anyone with the slightest spark of humanity near the real me. They must not see the real me. They must not hear the real me. They must never know the real me. Like the serpent in the garden, the inhumane must camouflage themselves in humanity if they are to successfully capture the soul of the humane. The wicked man's obsession to hide his true nature from the more humane elements of society is so acute it molds and shapes an alternate personality. A kinder, gentler personality. A humane looking, a humane sounding and feeling personality. I'd like to read from Leviticus chapter 10 out of the complete Jewish Bible. But Nadav and Avihu, sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and offered unauthorized fire before Adonai, something he had not ordered them to do. At this, fire came forth from the presence of Adonai and consumed them. Aaron was the first high priest of the Israelite priesthood, and Nadab and Abihu were the first two sons of Aaron. As such, they were part of the priesthood that was established by God. By all appearances, Nadab and Abihu were legitimate. They were legitimate priests. They were of Aaron's lineage. They had the look as they donned their priestly robes. They carried themselves as priests while performing their assigned duties of worship. 
They were appointed by Moses to be priests. And they were acknowledged by Aaron as priests. The entire nation of Israel recognized Nadab and Abihu as priests. But were Nadab and Abihu actually priests? Were they accepted, recognized, and acknowledged as priests by the only true authority? I say no. I say they were not actual priests. I think they were more like the people described by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 29. For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but remove their hearts and minds far from me. Nadab and Abihu may have worn the lineage and worn the robes, but their hearts, their true selves, were far removed from the one from whom and for whom the priesthood had been established. They were priests on the outside, but they were not priests where it really counted. That's on the inside. Nadab and Abihu were false priests. A true priest would have humbled himself before the great unseen one. A true priest would have fearfully followed every jot and tittle of the ordinance of worship prescribed by its author. A true priest would have felt deep love and reverence in his heart for his maker and for his maker's law. Now, I don't believe one soul, and I include Moses and Aaron, recognized the true condition of spirit that existed in Nadab and Abihu. I don't believe there was a single soul in the entire camp that recognized the illegitimacy of Nadab, Nadab and Abihu's claim to the priesthood. The scripture reads that Nadav and Avihu offered un unauthorized fire before Adonai, something he had not ordered them to do. Nadab and Abihu offered something before God they were not authorized to offer. The word offer is interesting. It means to present as an act of worship to present as an act of devotion. To offer something is to present one's self to another. An offering is a token of the loyalty, faith, and love residing in one's heart or one's self toward another. I believe Nadab and Abihu came across as loving, loyal, and devoted priests, even as they were preparing their censers, because I cannot find any reference of Moses or Aaron making the slightest attempt to restrain Nadab and Abihu from following through with their fatal act. This leads me to believe they must have assumed Aaron's sons were acting within the parameters of the law. What Nadab and Abihu offered, irrespective of how right it appeared before man, was not recognized by the one to whom the offering was made. God did not recognize their offering. 
nor did he recognize Nadab and Abihu as his own. Nadab and Abihu did not hollow the things of God, yet they approached his presence as if they did. I don't believe they were judged because of a technical error regarding the order of worship. I believe they were judged due to their attempt to cloak irreverent hearts with actions that were designed to give the appearance of reverence. And they were sentenced to death for pretending to be holy in front of a nation of people instructed by God and Moses to treat the priesthood, to treat the positions that they held as holy. <clears throat> like Nadab and Abihu masquerading as priests before the nation of Israel, the covert malignant narcissist impersonates roles that society reg will uh, readily recognize as humane. And more often than not, they get away with it. With clear realization and enthusiastic acceptance of his own inhumanity and moral emptiness, the malignant narcissist understands from an early age the necessity to conceal the dark aspects of his nature. Knowing full well the inhumanity of his enterprises, the malignant narcissist seeks, finds, and assumes the most humane of roles with which to conceal himself. With the grace and ease befitting a world-class actor, the practiced narcissist is able to step into these roles with seamless precision, imperceptible to even the most trained of minds. This includes the role of parent. Malignant narcissists are not actual parents. And I think most, if not all of them, know this. I think they are fully aware of the utter absence of compassion, care, and kindness in their own soul, even for the ones that they sired. So they take the circumstance at hand, the addition of little ones to the fold, and they use that circumstance to their personal advantage, which is the concealment of the inhumanity that's within themselves. Those of us who entered the material universe through the womb of a malignant narcissist and experienced firsthand their moral perversity, we know all too well the effortless effectiveness of their paternal role play. Effortless and easy in large part due to the low standards inherent with parenthood throughout much of our culture. As scapegoats, it's easy for us to see. From the inside looking out, we behold a society that collectively turns its head and looks the other way from the helpless and defenseless, forced to live under the harsh thumb of the subhuman. The archaic, simplistic, and superficial understanding of parenthood held by much of society makes it so easy for the narcissist. Too easy. 
Public and private institutions have done little to raise the pitifully low bar that our culture accepts as normal for proper parenthood to the advantage of the abuser. The facile imagery of family life spoon-fed to the masses through every available media outlet only reinforces those base notions. Once again, to the advantage of the narcissist. <clears throat> Inhumane parenting standards embraced, advocated, and propagated by society serve to encourage the dismissal, if not outright disregard, of most, if not all, abuse taking place within the dwellings of the inhumane. Let's face it, irrespective of your position or role in the family system, if you were fortunate enough to be overlooked by the narcissistic parent for the role of scapegoat, you have every excuse in the world at your disposal to ignore, if not outright justify, the inhumanity being carried out against the individual who was. There's enough suedo philosophy and idealism in regards to family floating around to feel pretty good about yourself as you join the chorus standing up for mom and dad. In fact, society at large will give you a pat on the back for making the right choice to honor your parents, no matter their inhumanity. She may be in a marital relationship recognized by the state. A man may have emitted the semen that fertilized her egg that produced children under her stewardship. Legal systems, medical systems, school systems, governmental systems, and all other social systems may recognize her as mother. But for the malignant narcissist, parenthood, motherhood, is no more reality than the proposition of humaneness abiding in her heart and soul. The malignant narcissist is a false parent. The malignant narcissist is an illegitimate parent. She has cut herself off from the things that make and define actual parenthood. Things like conscience. Things like empathy. Things like compassion. Rather than acknowledge and acting accordant with the emptiness inside, emptiness that would compel a normal human being to dread and avoid the role and subsequent responsibilities of parenthood, the narcissist enthusiastically exploits parenthood to her own advantage. Man puts on the front a firm, loving dad. Woman puts on the front of concerned and protective mother. Abuse is turned into discipline. Beatings are turned into corrective measures. Psychological torture is turned into exasperated concern. The depravity, the vileness, the wickedness, 
the darkness and perversity resident in the heart of the malignant narcissist can be packaged and presented as good parenting with little thought or effort. The vast majority, even members of the same family system, will succumb to the deception. And the narcissist knows this. The narcissist stepped into the role of parenthood secretly by the side door. The narcissist stepped into the role of parenthood illegitimately. The narcissist was never and will never be considered a genuine, legitimate mother in the eyes of truth. Because there is no truth in the wicked woman posing as a parent. Those who walk in the truth will come to recognize this. Those who prefer to remain in darkness will not.